Good evening, good evening, good evening, Facebook family and friends. Uh, welcome to the Garfield Greater Heights Church of Christ uh, midweek devotion. We want to say that we are uh, just blessed, uh, grateful, thankful to God for all that he does, all that he has done, and all that he is still doing. Uh, God is a good God. I mean, we just thank God for his love, his mercy, his kindness, his goodness. Uh, certainly it is a privilege and a blessing to once again find ourselves in the land of the living. Good evening, Maya. So glad to have you join us this evening. Uh, good evening, Sister Duena. So glad to have you this evening. <clears throat> it's pretty cold outside today. But, uh, God is good, even in the cold weather. God is good. Just trying to give a few a people a few more minutes to get on and get going. Uh, I, I trust you have your copy of this week's book. We are in chapter three, Amazing Grace. Uh, so we are in chapter three, dealing with Amazing Grace. And of course, we are studying out of the book of Ephesians. Uh, we want to thank Brother LaCroix for guiding our devotion on last Wednesday. Uh, thank God it's good to be back with you. Uh, thank God for the uh, visiting me in my state of health and blessing me to be once again with the people uh, that I enjoy being with at a time that I love being with them. Um, Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, Paul, again, he's carrying forth. Remember, we talked about chapter 1. He had the uh, good evening, Brother Lee. We talked about in chapter 1 the fact that uh, Paul was bringing the Jews and the Gentiles together. He was uh, bringing them all together, showing them that they all were saved out of the good will and the good pleasure of God through and by Jesus Christ. And they all had been given the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit as a seal uh, in the development of their knowledge and their growth in the kingdom. Uh, the Holy Spirit had been given to all of them alike. And then uh, Paul closes chapter one by saying that in Jesus Christ, uh, we will have the fullness of all that we ever need uh, in this Christian journey. Uh, the whole church, the whole body, uh, two words are synonymous, synonymously used inside the New Testament. Good evening, Brother Powell. Good evening, uh, Ann. Uh, two words synonymously used throughout the, uh, the New Testament. Uh, Paul primarily uses body, and he also uses uh, the church. And so we find out then that Christ is the head of all things to the body, which then means Christ is the head of the church, and he is the supplier of all things uh, to the church. Also, uh, then he says Christ will fill all of us in every capacity uh, that is necessary for the church to function and be the spirit of God on this earth or the presence of God or the presence of Christ on this earth the church will have everything she needs uh, by and through the filling or the fulfillment of Jesus Christ. Then he gets to chapter 2. Uh, chapter true 2. And in our handbook, uh, the author says that uh, one of the best known verses in the whole chapter, of, in the whole book of Ephesians is chapter 2, verse 8. By grace you have been saved through faith. Uh, but let's look at that verse. 
It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Uh, but the thought continues, it's not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Uh, so sometimes it, it, it is a well-known passage. It is a well-spoken verse. Uh, but sometimes it is also a well misspoken verse and it is also a misapplied or misinterpreted, mishandled verse. So as well as it being one of the best known verses of the Ephesian epistle, it is also one of the most widely recognized, uh, I believe, uh, with proper interpretation and application. Uh, one of the most misapplied and misinterpreted or misrepresented verses of the Ephesian letter as well. So the author asked us to look at uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Uh, and he's talking about grace. And I see he used a acrostic uh, design for the word grace he has in the book here in our book he has God's riches at Christ's expense God's riches at Christ's expense this is what the book has here uh, for chapter 3 as an acronym uh, for the or acrostic use of the word grace uh, so chapter 2 primarily focuses on grace and the work of grace and how we all came about in the receiving of grace. And what was God's intent or purpose for grace? Or what did God accomplish by his administering or his pouring out of grace on us? Uh, what was the will of God and what all did it include? And how do we take hold of this grace? Uh, so Paul begins chapter 2 by saying, uh, we were all dead in our trespasses and sins. So, uh, hey, sister. So, Paul then says, we were all dead in our trespasses and our sins. He has now brought the audience together. And so you have the Jews, you have the Gentiles, and they're trying to get acclimated and acquainted with being assembled together. Uh, because in the years past, they did not assemble together. Uh, but now under the umbrella of the Holy Spirit or the, uh, the uh, envelopment of the Holy Spirit, Paul now has this audience seated together. And so what he needs to tell the Jew and the Gentile is we were all dead in our trespasses. Now he says were. Because he's recognizing them, what our English language tells us, the benefit of a doubt. Uh, but Paul is just honoring them as children of God. Uh, from chapter 1, he's identified the Jew and the Greek or the Gentile. And he's brought them one. Now that he has them all together, he says, the Jew and the Gentile, we were all dead in our trespasses and our sins. And he says, would you formerly walk in time past uh, according to the course of the world? In other words, he's saying that as Christians now, Jew and Gentile, none of you were any better off than the other. You both were out there. It, it was a time when you all walked according to the way of the world. I, I think that's good for us right there. Uh, because sometimes as Christians, we, we want to be careful not to uh, elevate ourselves over people who have yet to come into the grace of God, over people who have come into the grace of God, and they might not walk like we have determined they should be walking, or they might not look like as we have determined they should look. And Paul says, he puts everybody at the base of the cross. That's what he does. 
He puts everybody in his audience, the Jew and the Gentile. He puts them all at the base of the cross. And he says, all of us, same thing he's writing here. He shared with the church of Rome, of Rome, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So he says, all of us walked according to uh, the world. All of us were under the prince of the power of the air, which we know from other scriptures is identified as satanic. We all walked up under devilish impulses and devilish inclinations, all of us, the Jew and the Gentile. And we have to be careful in the church never to think ourselves so removed from that world or that place that we can no longer identify others who are trying to come from that place. We have to be careful not to act like we always been saved. We have to be careful not to act like, um, or think even, maybe it's not an act. Maybe some people really think that now that God's grace has been poured on them, they're better than other people. Uh, they're better than them. Paul doesn't have a them. He has a us, a we. A us and a we because every Christian, every child of God, it turns past you walked according uh, to the prince of the air. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, uh, he says this power is still working now, even in the sense of disobedience. Look at verse number three. He says, among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of the flesh. Indulging in desires of the flesh and of the mind, whereby the nature and children of wrath, even as the rest, even as the rest. Uh, what, we, what would it have been like if God had not touched us with his grace? What would it have been like if God had not uh, been graceful and merciful and kind to us? He's saying here that all of us did what we wanted to do according to the desires of our own mind, and we didn't mind doing it. And, and here's the even a bigger understanding. We didn't even realize we were up under the demonic influence of the prince of this world. We never even knew it. See, uh, so instead of being lofty and high-minded, we should be humble. We should be grateful. We should be thankful. Uh, and remember, uh, the, the saying is, had it not been for grace, where would I be? Where would I be? Uh, verse 6 it's really, I mean, verse 4 is really what we want to catch. Verse 4 in Ephesians 2. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. See, all that has to be taken into context before we get to that. Uh, for by grace we have been saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. We, this has to come into play here with this thought. Uh, he says, even when we were dead in our transgressions, God made us alive together with Christ. The author asked a couple of questions in the beginning of the study uh, that I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time in because uh, the author asked, according to the passage, what are the effects of being dead in transgressions and sins? Uh, we know that when we are dead in transgressions and sins, we walk, uh, we walk according to our own lusts, our own desires. We are up under the power of the prince of this world or the prince of the air. And we are children of dis we were children of disobedience, and we were subject to uh, the discipline of God because we were walking in opposition to God. 
So, I mean, that's, you know, and then the author asks, have you seen sin kill? Now, we've all seen sin kill. Sin has killed a lot of our loved ones. Now, what's tricky about that question is all death is a result of sin. Let me say that again. All death is the result of sin. So when the author asks, have you seen sin kill? It's really kind of a tricky question uh, because every death we have seen, every death we have witnessed is from the impact or the fallout or the result of sin. Now, if we just move into the frame of time of seeing have we seen sin kill? We've all seen overdoses. Uh, we've seen domestic abuse gone into the way of um, fatality. Uh, we've seen um, the way the streets are. And I don't want to overemphasize the way the streets are now because the streets have always been dangerous they've been finding people behind buildings and and garbage dumps possum the river ponds lakes but it's at a higher level now maybe it's at maybe because it's at a higher level now because it's the media highlights it and the media keeps it in front of us the media does the job of sensationalizing it for us uh but in the truth of and the truth is uh we all have seen sin kill we have seen people we know loved ones family and friends that if they weren't the result of a sinful act that took their life maybe they were in part or in collusion with the sinful act that caused them their life so we have seen sin kill and and so um it's, it's a question that Sometimes we need to stop and think about, and I've shared this with you probably a, a dozen times. If you love your family, if you love your loved ones, maybe you should take the time to talk to them before you witness sin and kill again. We got some church members, family members that have gone away, that have gone astray, just, just, just won't do right. Maybe you ought to take the time to have a conversation with them and let them know you don't want to see sin kill again, especially not your loved ones, especially not your family. Now, you don't want to see sin kill again. So uh, maybe it's time to have that conversation. You know, that good friend you grew up with that you don't really like to impose your religion upon well maybe don't impose your religion how about uh, offering Christ and this saving grace uh, that God has the same saving grace that rescued you and called you how about sharing that with them uh, we have to move away I, the, talking about the church is important Talking about the kingdom is important. Talking about worship service is important. But I don't know if you put any of those three things in front of the saving grace that God wants to give them. I don't know if we put any of those things in front of what cross did at the cross so that we don't have to fall out about those things. A lot of times we can't talk to our family members. And I'm going to tell you the truth. It's because maybe we're not prayerful enough and compassionate enough. It's not about winning an argument. It's not about winning a position. It's not necessarily about showing them how wrong they are. 
as much as it is about showing them how great God is. When you go back and visit uh, Peter's message in Acts, uh, Acts chapter 2, uh, Peter says, uh, in Acts chapter 2, verse 29, Peter begins by saying, Brother, I'm going to say to you confidently, that David is dead and buried, and his tomb is with us. He talks about some of the prophetic speakings. He talks about some of the writings in the letters of Psalm. Then Peter says, This Jesus God raised up again, to which we all are witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself. Therefore, let all of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. See, Peter didn't begin with Hey, y'all know y'all wrong for what y'all did. Hey, y'all know y'all wrong for what y'all doing. Hey, y'all know y'all wrong. Y'all, y'all crew. He began by telling them who Jesus Christ was and what purpose God sent him. What purpose God raised him for. What purpose was all of the prophets of the letters spoken of? What was their purpose? And here it is right now in full effect. Peter is saying, this is what da- this is who David was speaking of. This is who David was writing about in his songs uh, or his hymns. And so then he says, yeah, this is the Jesus, the one you crucified. I think sometimes when we're trying to share the grace of God, we've got to gravitate away from Telling people how wrong they are. And I'm not saying that it's not critical. Yes, you, yes, they got to know. But can we maybe try to tell them how right God is? How right the grace and mercy of God is? Can we just start off with a conversation that tells them, you know, God really loves you? Have you ever tried that? Instead of, hey, you need to go to church. Hey, you need to stop doing all that stuff. Hey, you need to. That's 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 really the basis of our communication. Y'all can say amen if you can. Yeah, you need to come go to church. You need to straight. You need to stop all that foolishness. Uh, you need to stop running them streets and come on and go to church and yeah, all that street, all that whoremonging, all that doping, all that drinking. And all that party, just stop all that stuff. You're too old for that. Come on, you need to get right. How about just, hey, you know, God really loves you. Have you ever heard of what Jesus did for you because of God's great love for you? Have you ever have you ever thought and stopped and asked yourself how precious you are, how valuable you are, not in society, not as a human being? Just as a person, have you ever thought about what makes you so valuable? Maybe a conversation could begin like that. Might bode well or might be better than you need to stop doing all that stuff. You need to come on and go to church. Why are you living with that woman? Why are you living with that man? Y'all ain't married. Let me give you some more Bible that might just help you just a little bit. Because I'm not saying they don't need to know those things. They're wrong. I'm not saying that. And we're still in our letter here because the letter says, but God, here is where we are. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, 
even when we were dead in our transgressions. When we are supposed to be the extension of Christ, or sometimes we even say that we are the love of God visible that God pours out from an invisible God. We make God visible. That's what the church does. People may never see God. Well, people won't never see God. But we make God visible. We make the love of God comprehensible. So if you take this verse number four and put you and I in there, put yourself in there, put me in there. You put yourself in there, I'm going to put myself in there. But Kevin, being rich in mercy, because of the great love God shared him, he loved others. Even while they were dead in their transgressions. We have to know how to love people even when they're not right and, and share a saving message, message with them and not a condemning message with them. It's hard to, and some people come. I'm not saying those methods are not altogether uh, without fruit. I'm saying maybe the day and time calls for us to have or employ various methods and a different approach. Maybe a biblical approach that puts love and grace in front of condemnation. I'm going to come back here to Ephesians, but I want to give you another one from Jesus. Is that all right? Can we look at Jesus? All right, let's look at Jesus then. So let's look at Sixteen. Let's look at John three sixteen and following. Look at John three sixteen and following. And we're still talking about the Ephesian letter of grace. Uh, the Ephesian letter of grace. That's what we're still talking about. But when the Bible says in verse number four, but when we were still dead in our sins and transgressions, God poured out His love. Yes, Sister Joanna, more compassion. Amen. More compassion. And, and compassion, let, let me show you something in the Bible. Because everybody on the site, everybody on conference, everybody you will ever talk to can tell you what John 3.16 says. How many of you tell you what John 3.17 or 18 says? Look what the Bible says. Look with me. Look with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Whosoever should believe on him shall not perish, but have everlasting or eternal life. Listen to this. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. This then is the judgment that the light, the light has come into the world, and men love their darkness rather than their light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as being wrought in God. Now, I read all that to say that Christ is speaking, even though John is writing. And Christ said, For God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world. So, and I know the Holy Spirit convicts, but it's the Holy Spirit. Peter preached that the same Christ you crucified, God has made him both Lord and Christ. The same man you crucified, this Jesus, God has made him Lord and Christ. And they said they were pricked in their heart. And they asked, what must we do? Uh, God, Jesus right here says, God didn't send him into just the world. But when we're sharing God's grace with people, we start, we start off with a judgment. 
I don't I just don't like to see you getting all high like that. I just don't like to see you. I don't like the idea of you not going to church. We start off with a judgment. Instead of, I would love to have you come to worship with me. I would love, just come over Sunday. I'm going to tell you what uh, uh, Facebook channel to turn into. It don't have to be Garfield Greater Heights. Got a lot of great gospel preachers of God's great message of love available. Let me say it again. It doesn't have to be Garfield Greater Heights. God has plenty of men, far better preachers than myself. Amen. That are spreading the message of God's love. Invite them to a message. If, yes, we are. We are. We are we are forgiven when we place our faith in him. We're going to deal with that in just a moment. Because when we don't be kind to people in inviting them to the God's grace and love, it builds a wall. See, love is still the greatest, what Paul says. Faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Love is still the greatest gift of the Holy Ghost. Great. I mean, love is still the greatest gift of the Holy Ghost. Love is still the most magnanimous supernatural power that God uses to draw people. Love, because nobody can comprehend it. Nobody can grasp it. Nobody can stop it. Nobody can move it. It's love. And when we use love to gather people, it gets their attention. One of my conference call people said something. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, now, now and you answered, when we are forgiven, when we place our faith in him. And, and that's what a lot of people take from Ephesians 2, 8. People will say, we don't have to do anything because the Bible says, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself, it is a gift of God. Well, let's put all these scriptures together to make sure they say all the same thing. Because if we go to Romans 10, It says, Romans 10 says, um, uh, verse 15, uh, Romans 10, 15, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when we talk about faith and our sins being forgiven at faith, then we have to throw out the scripture that says faith comes by hearing. But hearing by the word of God. So when we collect faith it doesn't say faith saved us it says faith comes when we put our faith in Christ we put all of our trust in Christ Jesus said it this way why callest me Lord Lord and do not those things that I command you uh, when we say that we are forgiven, we place our faith in him, what that does then, it can cloud the understanding of the biblical demand or requirement for baptism. Peter, you really can't get any clearer than Peter, but I'm going to give you a couple. 
just in case. Um, we all familiar with Romans, but Acts 2.38, but we want to go there anyway. Because I want y'all to have a biblical understanding that faith is the step toward salvation. Faith is the step toward forgiveness, but faith makes you move. Faith makes you act. Um, Y'all, are you familiar with um, the great warrior that had the plague of leprosy in the uh, Old Testament? Um, I don't know why that name escapes me right now. Uh, I'm going to get it, though. Naaman, Naaman, there you go. Naaman, that was a great warrior, mighty warrior, but he could not come into camp because he had leprosy. But when it was given to him, what he had to do, it was astonishing. Now, Naaman believed in the Lord, but when it was told to him he had to dip in the Jordan, seven times it, it, it frustrated him because uh, second Kings chapter five I, I just took me I had to, I had to get there because I don't like to give you anything that you can't look at so let me mark this uh share this with you. Second Kings chapter five. So, captain of the army, highly respected. Look what it says in verse number one of Second Kings chapter five. Naaman, captain of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man with his master, highly respected. Because by him, the Lord had given the victory to Aaron. The man was a valiant warrior, but he was a leper. All right. So he wanted to know what he was going to do about this leprosy. So look down in verse number eight. It says, it happened when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes because he's looking for a prophet. Look what Elijah told Naaman in chapter, in verse number nine. Naaman came with horses, chariots, and stood in the doorway of the prophet Elisha. Elisha sent a messenger saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored to you and you will be clean. But Naaman was furious and went away and said, I thought surely you would have come out to me and, call and tell me to call on the name of the Lord. That's not what he told him to do. He told him to go and dip in the Jordan seven times. He said, I thought for sure he just would come out and call on the name of the Lord. It, it would not have taken away his leprosy. Just like today, calling on the name of the Lord will not take away your sins. You're going to have to obey the command to be baptized. You're going to have to obey the command. I, I really wish I could send you away by saying, oh, yeah, if you just believe, all your sins have been forgiven you, but that would decimate the oracles of God. And they asked Peter, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and go away and believe. That's not what he said. Repent and just have faith. 
That's not what he said. Repent and be baptized in the name or in the authority into the possession of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, for the forgiveness of your sin. Your sins are forgiving in the moment of obedience. It's not, it's not enough to just have faith in him because if you have faith in him, you have to do what he says. Let me, let me give you some more while we walk down through here because you need to have it all. Go over to, uh, I want to get over to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Acts. Now these are these are biblical accounts that you have to read. And it, let, me, let me share something with you right now. There's no need in reading the word of God, reading what it says, and then snubbing your nose at God to say that's not necessary. Because a lot of people don't know how to read the Bible. I'm going to help you because I love you. When you get beyond the book of Acts, Romans, uh, the first half of Romans, <laughs> from to chapter 10 or 11. Uh, yeah, chapter 11. Um, it's telling you how to be saved. Everything after that is telling you, is talking to an audience of people that have been saved. So the language might shift a little. The language might change a little, but it does not ever supplant what they did. In fact, you can find out what they did in the book of Acts. There's a lot of activity going on here. Ain't nobody listening to the lesson. Everybody chatting away. I mean, pay attention. You're going to miss something. You're not, you don't know how to tell nobody how to be saved. Listen. Acts 10. There was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion, an Italian. Listen, look at verse number two. A devout man who feared God and his whole house very charitable. The Bible says he gave many alms. And this is this is a non-Jew, but he's giving alms to the Jews. So he's taking care of God's people. Old Testament said, told the Jews that when people bless the Jews, they would be blessed as well. That's Old Testament teaching, but it's Bible anyway. He says he gave many alms to the Jewish people and he prayed to God continually. Then about the ninth hour, he got a vision going down a little bit. Because right now, we have a devout man praying to God, giving very charitable to God's people. So then the Bible says, down in Acts 10, and he said he started preaching to Cornelius. And he talks about God not being a partial person. No need to apologize. Just, I love you all. I just want y'all to get this because a lot of Christians can't explain to people why it is necessary to be baptized. Because a lot of Christians right on this page will go out and hug somebody at the hospital. Will go out and hug somebody uh, that they meet next week. And they will tell them. Don't worry, God still love you. Still, they still say, even though they never got baptized, I know they knew the Lord. I know they love God. And you should not be giving people those false assurances. You 
You've got to tell them what the Bible says. And when Peter got through preaching to them, they were speaking in tongues. That's down around verse 46. Before you get carried away with that, understand that this was the first open door to a non-Jew. Listen to me carefully. This is the first time the kingdom doors are opened to a non-Jew. What is why is that significant? That's significant because the same way the Jew came in, watch God, is the same way he brought the Gentile in. Only because He's God, but at the same time, he needed the Jews to be affirmed of God in the mix, and he needed the Gentiles to be affirmed that God was over them. So it says, Peter says in verse number 45 or verse 44 of Acts 10, while Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell on them on the circumcised believers that was with Peter, they were amazed. In other words, other Jews were with Peter. Peter didn't go down there by himself. You know, they ain't coming in the hood by themselves. They got to come in pairs. But he went, <laughs> Peter had company. And then <laughs> he said, and because the spirit was poured out on the Gentiles also, for we heard them speaking in tongues just like we. And then Peter said, no one can refuse these people baptism because we know God is over them because we saw the same thing take them that took us, the Holy Spirit. And he ordered them. Listen. He ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Not a suggestion, not a just in case, not if you want to. I'm going to give you what I gave you last Sunday. Not on Easter Sunday, not on the first Sunday of the new moon, not on the Sabbath day, not after the deacon board votes, not after we check your finances. All this is repeat, but I got to keep it in your mind. They say repetition is the best form of learning, so you need to have it. They said they baptized them right then in the name of Jesus Christ. It wasn't enough that Cornelius knew God and he was a good man and he was a devout man and he was very loving toward, this is a non-Jew, very loving toward the Jews. That wasn't enough. He had to obey. had to obey. Saul was a Jew anyway, but Saul, you know what happened on him on the road to Damascus. And he said, Lord, how am I persecuting you? Who are you, Lord? Acts 9. Who are you, Lord? That's what Paul said. And he said, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Get up and enter the city. Listen to these words, church. And it will be told you what you must do. I'm already... I, you know, I talk to you about these words, and, and I always encourage you. I encourage you, you need pen and paper because you need to go ahead and be able to write. I don't care what translation you use, it's going to come out the same. Go, rise up, and go into the city and see a man named Ananias, and he will tell you what you must do. The word must there is the word in the Hebrew 
I mean, in the Greek, that means it is a necessary. It is a, re a requirement. Listen. The word must is necessary. It's a requirement. Listen to me. That has to be accomplished in order to receive whatever it is expected. Come on, ladies. Neiman and Marcus is giving out any shoe size you want, red bottoms. But you must come to the mall. Don't think they're delivering anything to you. They're not putting nothing on hold. You can't send your niece up there to get yours while she's there. You can't call up there and tell them. It's, they said they're going to give you a pair of red bottles, but you must come to the store. So if you're expecting to get a pair of red bottoms, you've got to get to the store if you expect to receive the fulfillment of what your hope is. So when Jesus tells him, go see a man and he will tell you what you must do, whatever Ananias tells Paul, he's got to do it in order to be right with the Lord. Well, what did Ananias say? Brother Saul, the Lord, verse 17, verse 17, Brother Saul, the Lord has appeared unto you by the road who sent you to me that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and regained his sight. And he got up and was baptized and he took his food and was strengthened. Let's look at, let's look at Paul when he retells what happened. They don't, they don't believe what Paul is saying. Acts, here we go. Then we got to get out of here after this one right here. We'll get back to the lesson next week. But you need to have this because two things I want you to understand. When we talked about, two things we talked about is having the grace of God to love people in their transgressions uh, without trying to make judge them or condemn them. We want them to know where they are. We want them to uh, realize where God is and where God is trying to call them. But let's work through an operation of letting them know how much God loves them and how much God cares for them. Uh, Acts 22, verse 14. Acts 22, verse 14. And following. Uh, this this is Paul retelling the story now. Paul's retelling the story. And he says, Ananias says to Paul, the God our Father, he's appointed you to know his will. Listen, the God of our Father has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to many men of what you have seen and heard. Now, why do you delay? Listen, listen, this is important. King James says, why tarriest thou? Why do you delay? Get up, verse 16, get up and be baptized and wash away your sins. Here comes that other part of the Roman letter, whosoever should call on the name of the Lord, calling on the name of the Lord. Everybody thinks this thing about all you got to do is call on him. No, Paul is showing you what calling on him means. I'm calling on him in obedience of what he's already told me to do. You can't get away from the Bible. I, I know it doesn't feel good because we want to think otherwise. We want to believe. Sometimes we get caught up in believing that this can't be the only way. We believe this can't be the only way, but it is. I am the way. There is no other. The truth, no truth without me. 
and the life, all are dead without Christ because he is the source of all life. Now you need to go study verse 16 of Acts 22. Go do a word search. Go do whatever you want to do with it. It's not going to move. I'm going to just take you all the way through the rest of our every, every act in the book of Acts. God take you to the jailer in Acts 16, Acts 15, Acts 16. The jailer. When Paul and Silas are locked up. Right? Acts 16, Acts 16. I take you to Acts 16 with Paul and the jailer. And the Bible says when the jailer, the jailer, the ones that them had them, they were in prison, they're in shackles and bonds. They've been beaten, they've been stripped, they're in there almost probably naked. And the jailer comes in and, and God, Saul and, uh, and Paul and Silas are singing at midnight. The, shell, the jail shakes, the shackles fall off. The guard is about to kill himself. Look at Paul's compassion. It's just full circle back to our left. I've got to wrap up. Paul doesn't say, yeah, man, you know we shouldn't have been in jail. Yeah, man, you've been, you're been part of the people that was beating us. Yeah, man, you did a lot of wrong. You need to apologize. He doesn't do that. He says, hey, man, don't kill yourself. We're all here. Don't hurt yourself. We're all here because God loves you, and he wants me to tell you something. It says, he brought them out of, out of the jail. I mean, Acts 16, verse 8, 28. Do yourself no harm. We are all here. He had the lights turned on and he fell down before Paul and he was trembling because he was scared that they had got away. And he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved during your household. They continued to preach to him and they took him that very night and immediately he was baptized. Please stop thinking. All you got to do is say, yes, Lord, raise your hand, and you're saved. Please stop thinking. All you can do is be good, get, get rid of a few bad habits, and you'll be saved. Please stop thinking. All you got to do is, is tell the bishop to pray for you and throw some water on you, and you're saved. Please stop believing that, and don't tell that to nobody else. Share with them the love of God through the word of God. And let's start saving some souls. I see y'all already got your prayer request going. I'm going to scroll back down here so I can find out. Hey, Jackie, uh, who we're praying for. Kim White, Kim White and her family. Uh, Kim lost her mother, so please keep Kim in prayer. Uh, we're praying for uh, Donna James. Yes, we're going to keep Sister Donna James in our prayers. Uh, absolutely. Uh, we're going to keep Donna in our prayers. Uh, we see Sister Sullivan. So we definitely want to keep uh, Sister Kim White, Sister Donna James in our prayers. Uh, Jack, we got to keep you and Darren in our prayers as well. Uh, Brother Powell, for uh, the loss of your father, stepfather, and uh, and uh, Sister uh, Nelson as well. Uh, we want to also pray for uh, the neighbor of Ann, Larry Collins, uh, mom. Uh, Betty Collins, we want to pray. Kim, we're going to pray for you for traveling Grinch. I know you got to make a journey, so we're definitely going to keep you in prayers uh, for traveling Grace. Michelle, we haven't forgot you and your family, your daughters and your family as a whole, so we want to keep them in prayer and you as well. All right. Uh, Sister Sherry Boston, thank you. My God, what are you so good? You got to keep Sherry in our prayers. Sister Sherry Boston, keep her in prayers. What you got, conference call, people? Anybody say anything on the conference call? Yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. We want to keep uh, Sister Cotton in prayer, Brother Ben and his family, uh, the grandmother of his uh, of his son. We want to keep them in prayer as well. Uh, Dwayne is saying we're praying for Nazir Pittman and Brian Pittman Jr. Yes, we're going to keep them in prayer. Did I say that name right, Sister Dwayne? Nazir Pittman? Okay, and, and Brian Pittman. Uh, and Kim, we love you. We're praying for your, your comfort. And the condolences uh, from the church and from us individually for you and your family. Uh, so we're keeping you in prayers and your traveling grace. 
We thank God, uh, Brother Hatcher and his family made it back safely. We're glad they're back in town, him and his wife, his family, as they had a moment to get away and, and get out of the debacle of uh, what COVID-19 is trying to box us in. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. For our Father, we thank you for your love, mercy, grace, kindness, and your goodness. Please, we pray, we're praying for the White family in entirety, but our sister Kim and our sister Jodeci. Keep them, oh Father, as they travel. Comfort them in their hearts. Comfort them with the peace. Uh, let them know that for certain you are with them and you will carry them through, not only today, but in times to come. We're also praying for Sister Sherry, Sister Donna. We're praying for the daughters and the family of our sister Michelle. We're also praying for Jackie. Uh, her family, and for Darren as well, and the, the movement towards his recovery. Also, Sister Cotton, Brother Ben, not only just Brother Ben, but also the extended family of Brother Ben and the family of his children, as far as grandmother and mothers as well. Father God, we ask everybody that I may have overlooked, uh, Nazir, uh, uh, the children, and Brian Pittman, of our sister, uh, Duana. We're also praying for uh, the, the grandchildren and the children as well. So we want to keep them in prayer, oh Father. We ask God that you continue to watch over them. The Collins uh, mother, uh, family of neighbors of our sister Anne, we want to keep that family in prayers as well. God be with us. God bless us. Keep us until our next appointed time of gathering. Thank you for Jesus the Christ, our Lord and our Savior. In his mighty name we do pray. Amen. God bless you all.